Bon dia, OpenStack. Donem la benvinguda a Jonathan Bryce. Good morning, OpenStack. Please welcome Jonathan Bryce. Well, good morning again, everyone. Thank you for coming back for day two of the OpenStack Summit here in Barcelona. Um, hopefully, everyone is enjoying their time here and uh, having a good summit. Uh, I know that uh, there are a couple things I wanted to mention before we kind of start the morning. Um, first of all, there were some, uh, some bugs in the iOS app that, uh, that you might have seen if you are an iOS user. Um, those are fixed, and a new version has been pushed. So uh, please update your app and uh, get the latest version to get all of that functionality back. And also, um, I know that there were some, uh, some issues with, with lunch yesterday. I think in, in some of the locations, we were running a little low on food. Uh, I think in one of the other locations, they were giving out lots of food. <laughs> so we're going to work on, on balancing the, uh, the load a little better today, um, try to uh, make some adjustments. So bear with us. And, uh, thankfully, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of options right, uh, right around these venues here. So um, you, know, you, can, uh, you can always go enjoy the city and see a little bit of, of what's out there. I think, though, that, that maybe the most uh, talked about thing that I've heard so far uh, is, is what, what's up with the pigeon? <laughs> Everybody keeps asking about the pigeon. Um, so the pigeon's name is, uh, is Milo, or I guess, you know, Milo, if you were uh, going to pronounce it in Spanish. Um, and, uh, and the truth is that I don't actually know exactly what the pigeon's story is. Um, so, you know, you can create your own or uh, maybe find Todd Morey and uh, Wes Wilson, who, who are our design team, and, and uh, try to nail them down on, on an answer about what, what the pigeon is, uh, is here for. So um, yesterday, Mark talked a lot about, uh, about workloads that, uh, that are running on top of OpenStack and how OpenStack you know, is, uh, is really powering work that matters across a variety of industries. And uh, I thought it was, it was really cool to see the demos on stage, um, to hear from, from the users who are running different production workloads. Uh, the thing that, that is interesting about that is, you know, they are all finding great utility in, um, in basically using uh, private clouds and, and single clouds for most of those use cases. And uh, they are able to move more quickly in their business to do software development, to do data analysis. Um, they are able to save money. They're able to you know, deliver better value to their business from, from their technology. Uh, and that's, you know, again, mostly in kind of a, a single cloud uh, scenario. But I think that as we look to the trends that we're starting to see uh, really develop, one of the things that, that I think um, you know, a lot of people are talking about is multi-cloud. And the future, I believe, 100% is, is absolutely going to be multi-cloud. Uh, and, and these are you know, terms that, that get thrown around a lot. Hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, what do they mean? I want to talk a little bit about that today. And we're going to do some more demos and, uh, and try to not just talk about it, but also um, show what it means. But to, to set the stage a little bit, I want to talk about some of the things that are driving this cloud usage, and especially the need for, for actual, true multi-cloud capacity in the world. When we were closing the, uh, the day yesterday, we had some, some really, really interesting sessions from, uh, from some different scientists. Uh, Tim Bell from, from CERN, Dr. Rosie Bolton, who's working on the Square Kilometer Array, Paul Kajaya, who talked about uh, bioinformatics and genomics and, and doing work on the cloud. And, uh, and those are, you know, interesting use cases for what they, uh, what they represent in terms of research, in terms of knowledge that, uh, that we are, are, you know, just starting to uncover. But uh, to me, the thing that, that really struck me was the scale. You know, they're talking about incredible scale. And I think that an interesting thing that, uh, that I heard as I listened to their talks is scale is not just about the number of servers that you have, but it's about the scope of the problem that you're trying to solve. Mark yesterday, he said that 
that software is how we solve problems now. And the infrastructure that that software runs on is critical to enabling us to be able to solve new problems, to be able to do new things and, and really innovate in new ways. The square kilometer array, you know, this is just a fascinating project. I was able to go to Cambridge and talk with, with uh, some of the researchers there and some of the IT team who are putting together um, the infrastructure and, uh, and you know, the, the plan to build this out over the next few years. And it was really mind-blowing for me, you know, some of the numbers that they were talking about and also you know, the capability that we're going to get from that. Um, a few years ago, Eric Schmidt uh, talked about how since the dawn of time, humanity had created about 5,000 petabytes of data. And people argued with him about, you know, was that in 2003 or was it really, you know, had we done 5,000 petabytes by 1993? When you're talking about five or 6,000 years, you know, I think that an argument about 10 years is a little moot. <laughs> but, you know, the point is that, that this was a lot of data that we had created as, as, a, uh, as, a, as civilization had, had kind of come about. But what he was saying was, you know, in 2010, we were actually creating 5,000 petabytes every two days collectively as a, as a species. The square kilometer array, when it goes online, will be generating 5,000 petabytes every day. 5,000 petabytes every single day. And that's what they have to process and downsample um, and then, you know, ship around for, for research and, and to, uh, to share across uh, these different institutions that are participating in, in the square kilometer array. So, you know, as you look at this, we go from uh, a scale of, of 5,000 years to generate, you know, this, this amount of data to generating it every two days to generating it every single day from a single application. That is an incredible growth curve. But what I found even more striking was as the square kilometer array goes online, it's going to be in South Africa and, uh, and Western Australia. And, um, you know, it, it's basically a distributed software-defined telescope. So the infrastructure and the compute components are actually a vital piece of the scientific instrument itself. And this is, to me, what defines, you know, kind of the cloud app era that we're in now. It's not just about running something on a server somewhere that's not in your data center or, you know, in an automated way. It's really about tying the infrastructure and the software together to get the capability to work on these kinds of problems. And as they finish that deployment and, uh, and get it rolled out, by seven years, um, you know, after they've launched this, the square kilometer array will be generating 100,000 petabytes of data each day. When they launched it, um, Rosie said that, that they needed half an exaflop of computing. And when they get to this point, they're going to need multiple exaflops of computing to be able to process that, turn it into data that can be shipped to multiple clouds and, uh, and then studied and, and used for research. So that, you know, is amazing scale, incredible scale. Um, another thing that, uh, that we saw yesterday was a, was a demo of a, uh, of a mobile phone call, you know, an NFV workload. And uh, we have a lot of telecom usage, super user yesterday, uh, the award went to China Mobile. Um, another large uh, telecom in China is China Telecom. And uh, I, I heard a, uh, a development from them recently that again really struck me. Uh, they recently brought online uh, two new data centers and the combined space of those data centers is two million square meters. Two million square meters. Um, you know, we're in Europe, so square meters are, are a common uh, form of, uh, of measurement here. I'm from Texas. We don't use meters as much. I like to think in terms of acres. So some of you may know that I, uh, I have a little ranch in, uh, in East Texas. This is actually a picture of it. You know, it's got a pasture. It actually has three pastures. It has a lake, some ponds. I have cows. I have horses dogs, cats, you know, it, it's Texas. Everybody has a ranch, right? <laughs> uh, but my ranch is, uh, is, is just under 100 acres. So I was like, okay, 2 million square meters. What would that be in acres? How would that compare to, to my ranch? 2 million square meters is actually 497 acres. So it's basically like 
five times the size of this ranch. And uh, you know, their plan, as they roll that out, is to, uh, to basically you know, get to the point where OpenStack is controlling the infrastructure that's, uh, that's in that environment as they bring these data centers online and fill it up. So you know, that is, is a lot of, uh, of, of servers. They are not going to be able to, uh, to manage those like pets. They're going to have to manage them like cattle, just like the ranch. Um, but you know, the thing that, that, that I see here is we've got two applications only that I'm talking about at this incredible scale. Um, I, I saw a tweet yesterday. Uh, it was from Ben Keeps. Ben is, uh, is from New Zealand, and he always likes us to mention New Zealand. Um, because you know we, we do have uh, have community members down there, but uh, sometimes it, it shows up really small on the maps that we put. So, but but Ben tweeted yesterday about a presentation um, or, or a comment from Annie Lai's presentation, and uh, in his tweet he said uh, that Dengfeng Motors, a car company you never heard of, made four million cars last year and runs their IT on OpenStack. And, and you know, as I travel around and I get to visit different places where we have OpenStack meetups, OpenStack users, I'm constantly amazed by how many of these uh, kinds of uses are out there already. And then you know, things like the square kilometer array that are coming online uh, really just they blow my mind. Because no matter how big I think it is, no matter how much I think the potential for um, the technology that we're building is, it's actually bigger than that. And that's what I, what I am just constantly um, seeing as, as, we, uh, as we continue on this journey with, with OpenStack. And when we look at things like the square kilometer array, when we look at uh, the bioinformatics uses, um, the other thing that strikes me is that you know, we're in a, in a position where in order to enable these, we have to keep doing things um, to push the edge on technology because they need capacity, they need capabilities that we don't have right now. You know, how many of you have an exaflop computer? No one. <laughs> However, sometimes when people look at this, they go, OK, so that's a great opportunity. Who's going to win? Who are the winners and losers going to be? To me, that is totally the wrong question to ask. Because what we're talking about here is not, not just a single market that's going to be decided by you know, a, a couple of companies. Again, just these use cases that we're talking about, the square kilometer array, you know, millions of square feet of data center space, it's not something that any single company, any single country, any single institution, even a single community like ours can take on. But that's OK, because computing is something that uh, it really pushes us forward as, as, a, um, as a planet overall. The more access we have to computing, the faster we can move, the more research we can do, the more industries we open up, and, uh, and it, it's really a positive sum game. Uh, earlier this year, Sam Ramji talked about how open source is a positive sum game. And I think that people, you know, they can comprehend that because open source inherently has a collaborative aspect to it. Uh, sometimes when people look at cloud computing, they see that as just straight up competitive capitalism. But I think that, that when you see how critical computing is to the future of our species and to what we are going to accomplish together, you realize that computing is also a positive sum game. And, uh, and you know, this insane appetite that we have for it only grows and grows and grows. Uh, one example of that that I think is, is interesting that we've seen develop here in Europe just in the last 18 months is with the public cloud market. Again, you know, people think public cloud, it's, uh, it's something that uh, is going to be totally dominated perhaps by a couple of hyperscale providers. But you know, if you look here just in Europe, we have 15 public clouds with over 20 different regions that are powered by OpenStack. And a lot of those have come online in just the last um, you know, 12 to 18 months. And we're going to, to dive into this a little bit more in just a few minutes. But you know, this, is, this is a situation where um, you know, these companies are offering services that are bringing new users into the cloud because they are meeting regulatory requirements, they're meeting um, data privacy requirements that, uh, that have to be met and that were not being met by the public cloud before. So by doing that, you know, this is that positive sum game where it's bringing more companies into the cloud fold. And that, to me, is the opportunity that we have. Um, and as a community, we're already doing big things in this. And I think we, we can keep doing that. So as we think about that, 
just want to mention three things that I think we should focus on in OpenStack uh, in terms of our role in helping to drive forward this positive sum cloud game. So the first thing I think is really critical is we have to keep innovating. You know, we started out bringing um, basic compute and object storage uh, as cloud services and, and an open source development and, and delivery model. And since then, we've added a lot of other capabilities and a lot of other technologies. And, uh, and you know, that is awesome. That's great. But we have to keep doing that. We have to use what I think is our, our real strength, and that is that we've created this competitive marketplace of ideas where people can come and, uh, and develop implementations and see in the real world you know, who uses them, how do they shake out, which ones attract contributors, and grow from there. Um, and, and as we look at these use cases like the square kilometer array or NFV, uh, we heard yesterday about um, the, some of the projects that have enabled the level of reliability that you need to run a voice phone call. You know, those are great innovations that we've done. We've got to keep doing that to meet these new use cases. Sometimes when I say that, people go, OK, so you just want OpenStack to do everything. But that's not at all what I think. You know, the second point is that we always have to look for opportunities to collaborate. At the uh, Austin Summit, Mark Collier, in his keynote, he talked about collaborate or die. And he talked about um, the concept of a LAMP stack for the cloud. You know, when those technologies were put together, they were, um, you know, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, they were developed by uh, different teams, different communities. Uh, there were some license differences. Uh, they, they, it wasn't just one kind of monolithic package. But you put them together, and they created something that was incredibly powerful and really changed the World Wide Web from being a bunch of static content into the dynamic thing that we know of today. And that changed uh, every industry. It changed the way that we interact with, um, with each other. It changed the way that we do business. And I think that you know, we are on the cusp of seeing another wave of innovation based on cloud technologies. But we have to do a better job of combining these technologies and, uh, and giving people the ability to use them together in new ways. Uh, ultimately, you know, users, they, they don't care so much about what the technology is or where it came from. They care that it helps them solve their problems, you know, that it helps them solve their need. And OpenStack is solving a lot of problems and solving a lot of needs. But there are also other technologies out there um, like Cloud Foundry and OPNFV and Kubernetes and Mesos and others that uh, you know, solve an even broader set of problems. And together, that, I think, is when we can deliver the most value for users. So again, you know, thinking back to that whole um, win-lose, zero-sum game, positive-sum game, to me, if we get caught up in, uh, in trying to uh, compete for how the world exists today, we're going to miss the opportunity of the future that is so much bigger than, uh, than you know, what we can imagine right now. The third thing is, uh, is less about technology and more about the culture. And that is that we have to make it easier to replicate the successes that we're seeing. We heard from some users yesterday, like Sky, who, who's delivering you know, mobile or, or web streaming. Um, they are doing internal application development. They're running enterprise applications. They're doing all of this. And they're having a lot of success with it. But you know, what we have to do is, is figure out how to take the knowledge that they've learned and make it easier for other people to replicate. Um, when, uh, when we see successful combinations of these technologies, we have to make it easier to replicate that. And this is, uh, again, I think primarily a cultural thing. The shift to multi-cloud and even cloud, you know, single cloud, is a big change for a lot of organizations. And it's a big change for developers. It is a big change for administrators. It's a big change for the finance of IT. And, uh, and so you know, to that end, at the OpenStack Foundation, uh, we have started to publish a lot of material um, that, that, uh, that comes from users and is developed by users to explain what they've gone through on their cloud journeys and to try to help other people succeed on that same journey. 
Um, Mark mentioned yesterday the reference architectures that we've started to, uh, to publish that give a lot more detail about how people are successfully delivering big data or web applications or whatever it might be. If you go to openstack.org slash enterprise, there are also some books that, uh, that we've started writing collaboratively in the community that cover cultural change and, uh, and what's going on in, uh, inside of organizations as they adopt these technologies. And to me, again, this is not just about OpenStack, but this is about helping all of us to understand how to make these shifts so we can take advantage of these technologies and we can go seize those 100,000 petabyte a day opportunities and really move things forward. So when you look at that, when you look at the, the scale, when you look at the variety, I think that, that you know, to me, it's very clear that the future is going to be multi-cloud. I said I wasn't just going to talk about it, though. So you know, what, what does multi-cloud look like? What does, uh, does multi-cloud you know, feel like as you are interacting with it and, and working with it? How do you go about doing that? Well, we're going to do a demo now. Um, and uh, this is a bold claim. I have to admit that I have nothing that, uh, that I can say concretely backs this up, but you know, I'm going to say it anyway. The world's largest multi-cloud automated CI CD system does thousands of jobs an hour, 1.7 million test jobs in the last six months. It does this distributed across 12 different regions, uses 10 to 20,000 VMs a day, does it all only using OpenStack APIs. Um, so some of you probably know what this is. This is the infra testing system that we use to do our production development process for OpenStack. So this is a very important system. It is the system that manages every single change, every single forward step software development across every OpenStack project. And it does this for a massively distributed team of thousands of developers who are working all day, every day, all year long. So a very critical system for us, but also for everybody who depends on OpenStack.